We've just slipped into afternoon, so I'll say good afternoon to everyone. I'd, I'd like to start the uh, the I'd like to start the October 31st meeting of the downtown. Yeah. I'd like to start the uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, downtown Qu noon Qantas Club meeting and let on um, October 31st and let's start with Pledge of Allegiance. Mm -hmm. Flag is back there. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and today's speaker is David Vandenbosch, and he is going to speak on the history of horror films. And Jim, are you going to do the formal introduction? I am. I wanted to introduce David because before I introduce him, I'm going to give you a, another little anecdote of what it's like to be the program coordinator. <laughs> so I was looking for, well, this is a couple of months ago, I was looking for a speaker or a presentation to give us on October 31st, Halloween. And about two weeks ago, it dawned on me, what I wanna do is the history of horror movies, cool. And so I contacted the communication arts department and I can't remember who I spoke to, but she said, well, I could do it, but I'm busy. Uh, I'm busy that day. That's how you deal with these things. Um, but I will send an email out and see if anybody, any doctor, doctoral students or anybody else would like to present. And I waited a couple of days and nothing happened. On a Thursday, this was like on Wednesday, so the couple of days were like Saturday and Sunday. But on Thursday, I was driving home from someplace and I was li listening to WHA radio. And on the radio, there was some, uh, an assistant professor from the UWM talking about the history of horror movies. <laughs> so I immediately, when I got home, I immediately emailed her. And this was like a six o'clock on a Friday night. And I'll be damned if she didn't respond to me. And she too said, well, I'd be glad to do it, but I have a class that during that time, but I'll, why don't you check with this other fellow? And the other fellow at the UWM also had a class at this time, which led me to believe that everybody in communication arts have, teaches during noontime. So I, I was not hearing anything from the communication arts department. And so I decided, well, what I'll do is I'll find somebody, and I just recently heard about a nonprofit where they are all volunteers and they take bicycles and they put them together and give them away. And so I scheduled that person for October 31st. And of course, as soon as I get it, David emails me on a Monday morning and says, I'd like to present. <laughs> so now I've got two presenters. Oh, and by the way, did I tell you, I forgot that I had already scheduled way back when, and I didn't put it down, and I don't know why I didn't put it down, but I had scheduled somebody to speak already to us on October 31st, before I even thought about all of this other stuff. So now I've got three speakers on October 31st. <laughs> but because it's Halloween, I wanted David to speak. So I did reschedule the other two speakers, and we will hear them in the future. So that's my story. That's another little anecdote of the history and lifetime of what it's like to be the coordinator of the of the presentations, whatever I do, whatever it is I do. Okay, I spent all my time, so I can't introduce David. Oh, wait a minute. Just want to see if you were listening. <laughs> 
So David is from Belgium. He got his master's degree at the University of Ghent in Antwerp in Belgium. He studied art history and he had a major in visual arts. He wrote a master's thesis on the history of documentary film and its influence on the African cinema of the 50s and 60s, which sounds like a presentation in itself, doesn't it? David had been a freelance film critic for several years. He's the editor-in-chief of the Enola Film and Art website and has published both academic and non-academic articles on a wide range of subjects in both printed media and online websites. His PhD study here at the University of Wisconsin is devoted to the history of Steadicam and its influence on film aesthetics, linking these findings to the newly developing field of neurocinematics. And I was gonna Google that, but like everything else, I forgot it, so I asked David what it is. David is also part of the team of organizing the Antwerp Summer Film School. It's an annual summer event that combines scholarly lectures with thematically organized film viewing programs. And at the end of this presentation, at the end of the meeting, we're going to have a little, it's going to, not a poll, but it's going to be a contest. You're going to guess what it is. So let me present to you David. I can't pronounce his last name. Thank you. Uh, just a second. I have to look at the uh, Zoom meeting here. Uh, well, Richard's on the other side, so I hope uh, that is working out. I'll just test my. Yeah, okay. So um, just to uh, follow up on the little anecdote. Uh, I didn't know there was this whole thing going on before because um, on Thursday night, uh, Jeff Smith, who is uh, head of the film program in our department, was like, oh, by the way, uh, do you feel like doing a presentation on Halloween about the horror of, uh, <laughs> because I heard something from Amanda from the research center. So uh, shoot her an email and uh, she'll, she'll follow up. And that's how I sent <laughs> the mail to Jim. Anyway, uh, welcome. Uh, what I'm going to do today is, first off, I want to say I had a few clips planned, but apparently Richard, who is not here, is the person who brings the speakers and the sound equipment. That means there is no sound. So <laughs> there is little point in showing clips, which is um, obviously not ideal. I do have, however, a clip from a silent horror film, and I will show that one. And, um, but the other clips, unfortunately, uh, I won't be able to show because, uh, well, there's no sound. Uh, apparently, you need Richard for sound. OK. Um, what I'm going to try to do today is horror has a long history, but what I'm going to do is walk you through the uh, history of horror cinema, uh, starting with, you know, um, <coughs> the birth of cinema as an art form and then all the way up to contemporary horror. Uh, that means I'm going to be covering a lot of ground, about 120 years of cinematic film history. So that means uh, obviously it's going to be a pretty general overview. But if you're not too familiar with this stuff, it will help you to at least, you know, be able to frame a few things. And uh, I'm sure along the way, there will be films that you will remember, like from, oh, I know this one, or I see this one, etc. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get going. The first one, um, let's start in the, in, with 19th century horror literature, because it's impossible to talk about horror and cinema without first talking about horror and literature. Now, uh, an important predecessor was in the 18th century as the Castle of Otranto, which is generally considered to be the first gothic horror novel. Uh, the writer himself, uh, Horace Walpole, coined it as a gothic novel. It's about uh, a... Um, a prophecy that haunts the Lord of the Castle of Otranto, and it became the basis of what would be a boom of horror literature in the 19th century. Because while you not, might not be familiar with this one, I'm sure you will be familiar with this list of titles. 
1818, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, The Fall of the House of Usher, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Dracula. I'm sure these, these titles ring a bell, while most all of them have been turned into movies a few times. And, uh, but this, around here, cinema was born. So you can see at this point um, in literature, um, the Gothic novel is a big thing. And uh, also at that point, a novel like uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein um, is taken very seriously. It's not just like, you know, horror literature that is derivative and uh, it's just entertainment, you know, they're considered serious literature. However, that did not translate uh, into film because early cinema, as you may know, was a fairground attraction. It was not to, uh, not unlike photography. Um, big question: When was photography invented? No, nope. 1839. Uh, not unlike photography, um, it wasn't considered an art. Why? Because well, um, actually, the artist or the one making the photograph or uh, making the film doesn't have to do anything, right? You just the, the apparatus will register whatever is in front of it. There is no artistic process involved in that. Well, we all know better now, obviously. But cinema, you know, was struggling with that. So it was a fairground attraction. You would go to a fairground. You would be able to see these short one minute films. And um, cinema was trying to establish itself as something more serious uh, starting uh, in the 1910s. So what did they do? They started adapting um, um, famous plays. They attracted actors who came from the theater or they uh, wanted to show the world, we can, you know, this can be used for serious um, uh, subjects. Like for example, the 1903 film, um, The Passion and Life of Christ, which is typical for this time. Um, notice the fact that this yes is in color. This is not color as it came about later um, in the 1930s, but this is uh, tinted. That means you put the negative in a dye, different uh, bots of dye, and you would obtain this kind of tinted negative, which is very popular at the time. Uh, but this kind of serious, um, you know, uh, stuff like the life of Christ is what cin how cinema tried to establish itself as a serious art, you know, that was on par with literature, painting, and theater. Obviously, you know, you can see how within that um, context, horror wasn't really a thing. So it's only later that uh, from the 1920s onwards that we start talking about horror cinema. Now, Honestly, the, at first that wasn't in the US. Mostly we are talking here about uh, foreign films. Well, what US citizens would call foreign films, the rest of the world just calls them films. <laughs> and, um, but because back then, uh, guess what? Hollywood wasn't like the center of the world yet. <laughs> and um, you have films like, you may have heard some of these titles, Nosferatu, which is a famous vampire film from Germany. Um, well, it's basically Dracula, but they didn't have own the rights to Dracula, so they couldn't call it Dracula. So they called it Nosferatu. Uh, we have uh, Haxen, which basically means witches from Sweden. Um, a Page of Madness, a very famous early Japanese horror film. Uh, again, the same director, Murna, uh, who uh, made a film out of the Faust legend. And then there is the fall of the House of Usher, which obviously is an adaptation of the Edgar Allan Poe uh, novel. Now, this is the one clip I can show because it is silent. It is from Los Ferratu. And what I want you to pay attention to is how the imagery in that early 1922 horror film is still with us today. It is from YouTube, so it will link to a YouTube video. Oh, just a second. Yeah, uh, let me see if I can also screen that through. Yep, 
<laughs> okay, apparently it doesn't wanna. <laughs> I think it is just uh, getting confused with um, the Zoom uh, thing. Okay, so that means we definitely don't have clips. <laughs> anyway, um, it is um, a film that is still with us today. And uh, if you look it up on YouTube, you will find it. Um, let me go back to where I was. OK, so we had arrived in the 1920s. Now, Horror films in US cinema come about in the 1930s. It's uh, what is called the, um, after the transition to sound, um, Hollywood started becoming interested in genre. Think about this, when you buy a can of Coke, you expect the Coke inside to be exactly the same, no matter where you buy the can of Coke, right? I mean, you buy a can of Coke, you know exactly what you're gonna get. Well, in a way, film isn't the same. It also is a product. You know, we talk about it as an art form, but a Hollywood studio system, you know, film to a Hollywood studio system, film is a product. But you cannot sell the product on the basis of, well, it will be exactly the, the same every time. What you need is diversity. Every product needs to sell itself again and again. Right? So genre helps in that because at least it gives the uh, public some kind, something it can recognize. You all know what a Western is. You all know what a science fiction film is. You all know what a horror film is. You all know what a drama is or, or a love story is, right? So that is how Hollywood started investing in this idea of genre. And one of the important new genres with the coming of uh, sound was horror. And it's called the universal horror boom. Why? Because Universal Studios became famous with a set of horror films that you will all recognize. Dracula, Frankenstein, The Mummy, The Invisible Man, The Black Cat, The Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, you know, they're still extremely popular today as this is a board game you can buy and it's called Universal Horror Monsters. And it lets you play with these small figurines of the mummy and Frankenstein and, and Dracula. So you can see the basically often when you talk about horror films, this is what people think about. This is what horror is to many people, Frankenstein, Dracula, these classic black and white horror films. Again, I had a clip here. We're not going to try it this time. Um, so let's move on. In the wake of this uh, boom, horror becomes a very popular genre. I have a bunch of titles here. Some of them you may not recognize, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Dr. Jack and Mr. Hyde. Uh, these are uh, King Kong, obviously. Uh, these are all films from the 1930s when horror really became established as a genre in the, in the US cinema markets. Now, that started changing a bit in the 1940s. You may... Um, 1940s cinema, you know, you all can think of 1930s cinema as more glamorous, more polished, while in the 1940s you started getting more grittier kind of film. Uh, you may have sometimes hear, uh, heard the uh, term film noir, think of films such as um, uh, Humphrey Bogart and the Maltese Falcon or, um, you know, The Big Sleep, you know, grittier films. That's what came about in the 40s. And that also happened uh, with horror. A very popular genre in the 1940s is the female gothic. Films about uh, women who are often under the control of a, you know, somewhat malicious husband that either tries to murder them or gets, uh, for some reason, wants them to be declared insane. And they use all kinds of nefarious plots to uh, get uh, to that. The most famous one is uh, Hitchcock's Rebecca. Uh, you may have seen that one. And then there is Gaslight uh, with Ingrid Bergman. My name is Julia Ross about a woman who is driven insane by her man because he wants the inheritance and a uh, dragon wig with a very young uh, Vincent Price. Uh, this is really a uh, sub-cycle of horror films that is famous for the 1940s. Another one is um, 
Jacques Tourneur, uh, who is considered one of the earliest horror auteurs. Um, he was a son of a uh, film pioneer, early film pioneer Maurice Tourneur, who uh, actually shot a very early version in 1920 of The Last of the Mohicans. And uh, he is famous for three uh, films he made with producer Vol Newton. Uh, the most famous of them being Cat People, maybe a, a title you may have heard before. Now, coming towards the end of the 40s, uh, things change in Hollywood. Before 1949, it is like that, that the studios also own the theaters. That means certain theaters are affiliated with studios and the ones that aren't are, um, in a system that is called block booking. So what happened was the studio reps would go up to the theater owners and say, this is our slate for this year. If you want the A-list pictures, you know, with the big stars, then you also gonna have to take everything else. It's there, you know, there's no, you can't like say, no, I want this film. No, that is it. Now, uh, theater owners uh, got all the way to the Supreme Court and in what has become a famous uh, landmark ruling, the Paramount decision, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, that uh, was, well, I'm not going to go into the details, basically, the studios had to sell their theater chains and said, like, this needs to be a different system. It cannot be that the studios basically control everything from production to distribution, because then you get basically a monopoly. So this cannot be happening. So from the 1950s onwards, studios were forced to start selling uh, their uh, theater chains, and that changes the movie market. All of a sudden, you have a market for lower end films, which are called B films. B films are originally the programmers that the studio unloaded upon the theater owners, as you also have to keep these cheapies. But from the 1950s onwards, they become a thing of their own. And you start uh, getting a lot more attention to uh, niche audiences like young people, for example. Before the 1940s, you know, um, Hollywood wasn't very interested in children's films. Uh, you may think of something uh, like, well, Disney Snow White, but that's not a children's film. It was never meant to be a children's film. And I dare you to show it, uh, to, sh to sh sorry, show Snow White to a three-year-old. They're gonna have nightmares. <laughs> I mean, that was never meant as a, as a children's film, for example. So that starts changing in the 50s. They become interested in teens and you get things like, drive-in cinemas and 3D showings. And you get all these uh, wonderfully colorful, colorful horror films that become science fiction and horror hybrids like uh, The Creature from the Black Lagoon in 3D. I have seen a uh, showing of this film in 3D, a screening. Um, the Thing from Another World and Them them uh, being about, uh, we're into the 50s by then, about the dangers of uh, nuclear warfare because these ants become giant monsters because they are exposed to nuclear radiation. Somewhat along those lines can be found in, um, oh, sorry, wrong button, can be found in, um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, uh, a film from 1956 by Don Siegel, um, who that um, basically is um, horror films become start having subtext. This one is clearly about uh, McCarthyism in the US. It is about uh, aliens from outer space who come down to Earth and they have these kind of, I hope this, I'm pronouncing this right, pods, like, uh, you know, what a, P-O-D, let's spell it, pot. And, um, you know, they make a perfect copy of a person and they replace the person with this pod version. And that was, you know, it's not hard to think about, you know, communists infiltrating the US, you know, the whole McCarthyism uh, ID back then. And that was, uh, that's probably why this is still such a famous classic. Uh, it's considered to be, you know, this film was really about what was happening at the time. Now, I talked about the radiation and, uh, you know, the dangers of nuclear warfare. You find somewhat uh, something along the same lines in Japan, 
where you have in 1954, you have a cycle of horror films called Kaiju movies. And Godzilla obviously is the most famous one. Godzilla is a monster that, you know, is born out of the radiation of, uh, you know, the uh, nuclear attack on Japan and then uh, wrecks havoc on the city of Tokyo. Uh, another uh, important strain of horror films is in the UK where Hammer Studio is producing a, a, mainly in the 50s and 60s, a whole series of horror films, uh, most famously Dracula with Christopher Lee as uh, the uh, blood-sucking count. Uh, again, these are films that have become somewhat of iconic. Most people remember them from late night television, uh, etc. All right, let's move on to the 1960s. Things change again. Huge quake is the term that is used to describe, you know, Studios becoming more and more interested in uh, films for teenagers. You know, uh, they're the ones coming to the drive-in. Uh, the studio system is in a crisis anyway, so it's hard to find an audience for even the most prestigious films. But you get two sets of films. You get, on the one hand, very prestigious, highbrow horror films, something along the lines of Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, uh, Jack Layton's The Innocence, or Roman Polanski's Repulsion. And then you get these low-end, low-budget films like uh, Black Sunday, The Bride of Dracula, or The Beach Girls and the Monster. You can all imagine what that is about, right? So I have a few pictures here. This is from the Japanese Onibaba that won the Academy Award for Best Foreign Film. This is from the Beach Girls and the Monster. <laughs> and uh, this is Mario Bava's Mask of uh, Black Sunday, sorry. Another important development in the 1960s is the rise of independent producers. Again, uh, because two things happen. One, the studio system is in complete decline. Because of the Paramount decision, so studios are looking for new audiences and they think, well, the best new audiences are, you know, underserved audiences like teenagers. Uh, or, for example, in the early 70s, uh, urban uh, Afro-American people who don't see themselves represented on screen, then you get something called the black exploitation cycle that also ventures in horror with, for example, Blackula. You can think what that is about. Okay, so independent cinema becomes important also because the production code is abolished. You, the production code, let me quickly uh, uh, state this, in, uh, came about in the late 20s, but was enforced in 1934. What was the production code? Hollywood uh, was worried about the fact that uh, a lot of... Um, <laughs> religiously oriented groups like the Legion of Decency, etc., was uh, trying uh, to convince the US government to um, make a law about uh, what could and could not be shown in films. Because they were like, well, you see people committing adultery in movies or, you know, etc. And we're like, uh, we need to put a stop to this. So Hollywood was worried, well, if that becomes a law, then we have a serious problem. So what we should do is like self-censor, right? So hence the production code. All the studio heads got together. They found this, um, this guy um, called um, Joseph Hayes, who was, you know, he was very well known in these religious circles. I'm like, you're going to have this office because that's going to that's gonna look good. And uh, we're going to have this code with everything that you can and cannot show. And in that, that way, it won't become law. So we don't have to worry about that. And then you get these very weird things. For example, in a 1930s film, you will never, ever see even a married couple sleeping in the same bed because that was not allowed. You couldn't show that. Now, uh, obviously, creative directors played around with that, tried to undercut that. There is all kinds of, uh, there's this famous line in Gilda, a film from 1947, where, you know, uh, the guy walks into the room and then, uh, are you decent, Gilda? Gilda? And she, um, Rita Hayward, you know, uh, moves her head and goes, decent, me? There was a clear step at the production code. So, you know, and by 1976, when Bonnie and Clyde came in theaters, the 
uh, the production code was completely abandoned. But that gave independent productions, uh, producers a chance to start making horror movies that were a lot more gory. And, you know, that pushed, you know, the limits of what could be shown. So in the 1960s, you get famous films like Night of the Living Dead by uh, George A. Romero, a completely independently produced film. Um, and uh, that came, uh, became a landmark in horror film history. It is a terrific film. It is very scary, but it was also a film about what was happening in the 60s about Vietnam and about, uh, you know, the distrust in um, politics, etc. But it was translated into a zombie film and it is still a landmark film. If you have never seen it, try it out, although it does take you need to be able to stomach some gore <laughs> for this one. Uh, and then uh, Roger Corman who is a very famous producer who all the way into the 80s and even early 90s produced low budget films um, in which he gave very young talented directors a chance to produce either action flicks or low budget horror flicks to just you know get to know the you know get to know their craft this one is particularly famous dementia 30 from 1966 because only six years later, its director, a young man named Francis Ford Coppola, would make The Godfather. <laughs> and he started out working for Roger Corman, doing this charming little horror flick called <laughs> Dementia 13 about an ex-murderer. <laughs> um, other famous names, Martin Scorsese, he then do a horror film, he did an action flick for uh, Roger Corman. William Friedkin, who would uh, go on to direct The Exorcist and The French Connection. And uh, in the early 80s, a boy named Jimmy Cameron, who would become uh, the director of Titanic, Aliens, The Terminator and Avatar, was working as a prop guy on, this, uh, on the set of Roger Corman's Galaxy of Terror. So Corbin's been a very important figure. Um, on to the 1970s. At that point, horror becomes a viable blockbuster genre. Before that, horror was always a bit, you know, on the fringes, but back at that point, it becomes a blockbuster genre. The Blockbuster, as we know it now, was kind of invented in 1975 with Jaws. Why? Because up to that point, you had first-run theaters, second-run theaters, third-run theaters, fourth-run theaters. That would mean a movie would open in the big theaters in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago. And if you were living, well, Madison would be it's the state's capital, but if you were living, I don't know, in flyover country somewhere, USA, it could take up to a year before you got to see the movie, before it got there, right? That changed with Jaws, when it did like um, saturation booking. Jaws was released on 400 screens at the same time. Back then, there was a huge number. Now films get released on 4,000 screens at the same time, you know, around the country. But back then, 400, and that's how the blockbuster um, ID came about. Now, uh, horror was clearly, well, Charles is basically a horror film. It's a monster movie. Became a very big genre. You may uh, all know films like The Exorcist, The Omen, Alien, Carrie, The Shining. All of these are very famous titles. Horror was now a blockbuster genre. Another strain of horror films, however, going a bit against these films that, you know, are a bit more polished and, you know, are uh, better suited for a wide audience is what was called grindhouse horror, which was extremely gory films that really push the limits of what could be shown on screens. The most infamous one, I should say, is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre by uh, Toby Hooper, which even today, if you watch it, is still a very, very unnerving film. Not in the least because of its um, 
uh, soundtrack that is like an attack on your nerves. It's a still a very powerful film. Uh, other um, films that are f uh, famous or infamous, The Hills Have Eyes, Lost House on the Left, Alucarda, all of these are films that you may have, may not have seen, but at least have heard of. Now, um, moving into the 80s, some of the directors that came out of this grindhouse tradition started uh, moving into more mainstream cinema. And that is when you get the series of famous slasher films from the 1980s. Most famously, you have Nightmare on Elm Street series and the Friday the 13th series. I'm sure this looks somewhat familiar. You've seen this before, right? And Halloween. The original is from 1978, but then uh, you have all the sequels. Uh, this is, uh, don't, don't let the final chapter fool you. This was only the fourth one, and there are 10 Friday the 13th films. So the next one is just called A New Beginning. So, um, and then, as you can see, sequels have always been there. People sometimes say, well, you have all these sequels nowadays. Well, you had sequels in the 1930s. There are seven, seven Tin Man films with uh, Mirna Loy. So, but nobody remembers that. Um, the 1980s also has a boom of female directed horror films. Um, Humanoids from the Deep, again, a Roger Corman. Um, uh, production is famous, then you have something like Slumber Party Massacre. It's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, Rachel Talalay uh, directing Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. Again, not the final one. And then very, if you ever have a chance to see this film, this is a French poster, uh, Near Dark by Catherine Bigelow. Catherine Bigelow would become the very first female director to win the Academy Award for uh, Best Director with uh, her film, The Hurt Locker, about a, a bomb squad in Iraq. And uh, she would be nominated again for uh, Zero Dark Thirty about the killing of Osama bin Laden. But arguably, I'd say her best films were in her early period when she made these kinds of uh, interesting horror films. And if you ever get to see this one near dark, it's an amazing film. It's a vampire film that never uses the word vampire and that plays in the US deep south, you know, has a, uh, it's, it's, you know, it basically looks like Amer Americana, but it is about, uh, about vampires. It's a terrific film. Um, and then you have the horror auteurs. You have these people that come out of these extreme traditions from the 1970s and move into, you know, somewhat more mainstream film, but all of a sudden they're called, you know, the idea of the uh, director as auteur comes from the French uh, Cahier du Cinéma from the 1960s. And uh, you start seeing that in horror films where who the director is becomes more important than what it is about. And famous films are obviously, um, Sam Raimi's Evil Dead, but also people like John Carpenter, Stuart Gordon, who is an alumnus from the UW Madison, by the way, and uh, David Cronenberg, the Canadian born director who directed The Fly and Scanners, etc. Right, uh, the 1990s, the rise of self reflexive horror, something like Scream, films in which the characters are aware that they are in a horror film. Scream, for example, is famous for a scene in which characters say, oh, I'll be right back. And someone says, you shouldn't say that. That's when you get killed. You know, that's what I mean by self reflect And Scream by what's Scream and, and Scream 2 is our, its most famous. And then you have a whole slew of films that try to copy that until, well, pun intended, the genre just bleeds out, okay? <laughs> and um, then you need something new again, and in 1990s, you get J-horror. J-horror stands for Japanese horror, basically Asian, Asian horror. It was already a big thing in the 1970s and 80s, but it is only in the 1990s that it really became popular in the West. And you get uh, things like Rengu, immediately followed by its American remake, The Ring. And it's a typical, uh, as you can see from uh, this image, you know, the dark haired spooky girl, that's a typical image from a J-horror film. Why? Because unlike us, ghosts in Japanese culture aren't uh, 
floating white sheets. They are usually long haired, dark haired uh, girls in a white robe. Uh, that is very different. Uh, I can tell you, um, you may not want to watch this thing. I uh, saw this one in the early 90s and I remember being scared to death by it. It's <laughs> terrifying. Um, then, um, 2000s, American cinema, uh, you know, meta horror and self reflexive horror has run its course and comes up with something new, which we label somewhat, it's a weird name, but it's called torture porn. Um, hostel would be a, it, it means these are films that are basically about teenagers um, venturing out into the world and then getting, uh, you know, into the hands of maniacs that uh, submit them to all kinds of torture, uh, to, to all kinds of torture. Famous films would be Saw or Hostel that are really, really gruesome in as far as, you know, what characters have to go to. Uh, it is a cycle of films that is not well remembered just because it is only remembered for how many buttons it is trying to push, but these things were decent hits in the early 2000s. Moving on, uh, we have, we, we, we're almost, you know, where we are today. Famous is the Bloomhouse model. You may have seen this logo. Bloomhouse Production is a production company that not unlike Roger Corman before, makes low budget horror films and gives young talented directors a chance to make films for two or three million and then uh, when these films then make a return of about 20 million that's a good cash in so you get directors like uh, lee wanell that make the infant or something like jordan peele who is now an a-list director who uh, infuses horror with questions of race in get out that film only costs two million to make it's made 235 million. And then we're back more or less where we started, where famous tales are being adapted now in what is called new prestige horror, something like Robert Eggers' um, The Witch or uh, Midsummer uh, by Ari Aster. I signal this time to uh, wrap up. So uh, I hope I have kind of given you an overview of a uh, full history of horror film. Time for a couple questions, and I'm gonna start out. What's your favorite horror movie? <laughs> ah, I'd have to think about that. Near Dark would be among them, and um, The Shining, Near Dark, and um, thinking of a few others. There's probably oh, and Neil Marshall's uh, The Descent. Okay. We, we, oh, go ahead. Where did the movie? Well, uh, that is a subcategory of films that were mainly popular in the 1970s and 1980s. For example, Wes Craven, director of um, Nightmare on Elm Street, also uh, did the film The Serpent and the Rainbow. That was about voodoo. That was 1987. And uh, so that's a subcycle of films, 1970s, 1980s, that falls into you know, some of these categories, something like Alucarda, which is Grindhouse, is about voodoo. Um, so that's kind of a subcategory. I didn't have time to also break that in. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, we have like a horror opera film. Uh, what we've read about it is it's happening this Friday with dripping severed heads, etc. So I'm sure it's not sold out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've read something about it, and obviously some uh, horror operas like uh, the, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street have been f have been uh, put into film. So yeah, <laughs> it's definitely a thing. Do you consider Rocky Horror Picture Show? A horror it's movie? not a horror movie. The Rocky Horror Picture <laughs> Show. <laughs> it's not a yes, but it is because it has to do with dressing up and costumes. But it was originally a midnight a film from the Midnight Circuit. Yes, and so, but it's not really a horror film. What it does do, however, is spoof early horror films. Uh, okay. Bill, 
Um, that is from uh, The Witch, a New England folk tale. And no, uh, it's this place in the 16th, 17th century, early settling of America. And she is an immigrant from uh, Europe who is settling in this uh, small community somewhere in the Northeast, I think. Yes, so it would be Amish country. And uh, because of a few things she says, she is, uh, she is prosecuted as a witch. Jim, I'll give you the last question. Um, I read just recently that there was a, 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 I guess, a torture movie uh, genre that um, some people took the director to court because they truly thought that the, uh, the character. Yes, yes, you're talking about uh, Flower of Flesh and Blood. It is a film from the 1980s in the guinea pig series, which was a Japanese series of extremely gruesome horror films. And um, there, were, you know, there were rumors out there that those were snuff movies in which people really get killed. And famously, actor Charlie Sheen uh, got a copy of that film. Now it's easy to find. And, um, but back then, you know, a bad, uh, great VHS tape, you all remember that, and uh, watch that film and send it to the FBI claiming someone actually got murdered in that film. If you look at it now, it's like, what the what the hell were they thinking? <laughs> I mean, no, obviously not. I'm not going to tell you the plot because it's extremely gruesome. But uh, let's say it involves dismemberment. And so he thought it was real. The FBI, the FBI thought it was real. And yes, the makers had to prove that they were special effects. <laughs> it's an infamous case, yeah. Thank you very much.